Good morning, everybody. It is such a gift for me and an honor to be here with you today. And I'm immensely grateful that I made this journey and that you chose me to be part of this amazing, amazing meeting. I sent an email this morning to some of my friends and I said, I'm in paradise. It doesn't have to look any better. Now, war was over on May 8th, 1945 in Europe, not in Asia yet. But it was not over as far as, yes, we are liberated on May 8th, 1945 maybe the last camp that was liberated by the Russians. Other people were liberated by Americans. We didn't care who came, just somebody who should come and, and bring us to life again. So May 8th became my second birthday. And I celebrated almost every year, wherever I am, the experience the joy of being alive. My talk yesterday was about my first miracle, staying alive, giving the gift of life. While in my camp we were 15,000 children, only 1% made it. And I'm standing in front of you. That is a miracle. But I have, thank you. I have a second miracle which will become apparent what I'm going to talk to you about. Now, we had no clue where our families were taken to, aunts, uncles, more distant relatives, but the end of the war, we lost at least 13 immediate members, including my beloved grandmother. We didn't want to believe that she was gone, still hope in our heart, and 20 altogether, more distant relatives, 20 people in my family were slaughtered. That's, there's no better word that I said yesterday. Now we had a tremendous typhus epidemic at the end of the war. They brought in people from other camps who were not liberated yet, because Eichmann still wanted to kill every single Jew in Europe. Auschwitz was liberated in January, but the war was still going on, and the Holocaust was still going on. That's why even gas chambers were being prepared in Terrazin, where I was. They were not complete yet, and they were bringing in these horribly, horribly sick people from Buchenwald, from other places where they were not uh, liberated yet. And they kept all that from us about gas chambers. In fact, there was a family camp in Auschwitz. They called it the Terrazin Family Camp. And they had to write back to us, oh, it is so nice here, come and join us. That family camp was completely liquidated. Uh, and soon afterwards. Now, we were on quarantine right after the war. Even it was written up in the New York Times, and we could not go home. Finally, a bus came from Stuttgart, from where we were transported from, to pick up the few survivors. There were a few transports that landed in Terrazin. Ours was the first one, and we were at one time about 1,200 people close to it. At the end of the three years, there were 13 survivors, 13. And a whole family intact, mother, father, and child. That alone was a miracle because that hardly ever happened. And they picked us up with a bus, uh, all the people from the different transports. Uh, there were a few of them, so maybe about 50 people or so. And we went through war-torn Europe, 
especially Germany. I saw Leipzig uh, right after the war and Dresden, which was firebombed tremendously. Uh, there were no houses standing. We arrived in Stuttgart and they put us into what was called a displaced persons camp because we didn't know where to go. I remember my first meal there. They had beautiful white tablecloths on the table and they gave us a chicken noodle soup. This was the first good meal I had in three years because it got so bad in Terrazin that we would even eat dandelion leaves. You had no vegetables. So to have a real bowl of soup, it was, I ate it so slowly just to taste every little, uh, every little drop. And we stayed there a very short time and made our way back to my grandmother's little village hoping maybe she did survive, maybe. We went back and that house was taken away when we were deported. And there were people living there. And they prepared one room for us in our own house. That house belonged to us. There were people there, living there. A short, of course, my grandmother wasn't standing at the door. It became really apparent to us she will never come back. And we moved then to a neighboring town, got an apartment, and life was good. I went back to school. I didn't know what grade I belonged to. Fourth grade, fifth grade. I never even finished my first grade. And I will say, the children and the people at that time were quite nice to us. Of course, everybody said, well, we didn't know about that, we feel bad, and all that. Uh, and we were asked, can you point out some of the people who did harm you at that time, who were bad to you? And we did not point to anybody. We stayed in Germany about nine months. My father had his business again. He was selling dry goods. It started out on a bicycle, then um, got bigger. And we were doing very nicely. And life was good, but not good enough. The memories were absolutely too strong, and we needed to leave. And President Truman of the United States opened the doors to these refugees. We got uh, on the second boat that came here. We had already papers to go on the first. But my father had to take care of some things. And we came to New York in May, May 23rd, 1946. I was 11 years old. These were troop transport ships, very rickety, they were built very uh, quickly to bring the troops to Europe for the fighting in World War II. Many of them cracked up in the mid-ocean. And it was a very rough uh, crossing, it took 10 days, and everybody was sick. Now the men slept on hammocks under the waterline, women and children A and B deck. And believe me, there weren't very many children on that boat because most of the children had been killed. We arrived in New York Harbor, and my mother had a brother in New York who was actually fighting in World War II for the Americans. Very big battles, Anzio Casino, huge battles. And they lived in an apartment, very crowded. My aunt and uncle had their father-in-law living there. And soon afterwards, uh, there was a distant cousin who took me in. They had two children, so I went to school with them for a few weeks until school closed. I didn't speak any English, and I had to learn. And my parents had to get a job. They got a job working as a couple in a big estate, very rich people. My mother became a maid, cook, and my father a butler. And I was allowed to play with the children uh, from that family. 
And somehow there was something I just didn't feel very well. I had a cough. I felt tired. Now, we were transported from Bremerhaven, you know, up to Bremerhaven, take the boat in cattle cars. There was nothing else. We were used to all of that, and we didn't care. And it was cold in the cattle car, and I got sick, and it got worse and worse. And the woman who owned, you know, the owner of this uh, estate uh, said, you know, I don't like her coughing like that. We have to take her to the doctor. So they did. And the verdict was quite strong. There was a girl in the camp, in our compound. We were in a compound with all disabled war veterans. Our fathers had their legs off, arms off, shots still draining in the head. Terrible things, and even worse. And one child, there were children there too, and we played with them, you know, as best as we could. I told you yesterday of the conditions there. And one girl got a little bit more food, maybe an extra piece of bread, very watered down milk that looked like water. And we were told, don't go near that girl. She's very sick. And she has a terrible sickness, and it's you will catch it. It's awful. And I prayed to God at that time, God, please let me have what she has. I'm hungry. I want more food. And unfortunately, that prayer was answered at a really terrible time. The doctor's verdict was, I had to be hospitalized immediately that I had tuberculosis, which this girl had. And it was a bad case. Both of my lungs were affected. And I was placed in a public hospital. We didn't have any money. Even in those days, it was, I think the cost was $5 a day. I was on a ward in the children's hospital, infectious diseases, and those $5 a day were paid by a Jewish organization because at that time, you could not be a burden to the government. You had to have a sponsor. And there were two wards in the hospital was called Sunshine Cottage, a children's hospital. One ward was polio downstairs, and up ward 200 was tuberculosis. And um, it was um, part of a bigger hospital called Westchester Medical Center. It means nothing to you here. But it is today, the center is a very big uh, place. And the hospital does not exist anymore. Only the building, it's an office building. Because in the meantime, polio was almost, almost eradicated with the vaccines and so forth. And tuberculosis uh, was also in better shape. They could close it down. Uh, certainly, it is raising its head again, especially in poor countries. Uh, it never really went away. It's a disease that has been here for thousands of years. It never died out. And what was the cure? We had two, war, two sides to the world. One side was the girl's end, the other the boy's end. One bed next to each other, total bed rest. And we were in bed for, well, I was in bed for two years on total bed rest. There was no cure at that time. Either you rested, uh, or you got better by yourself, or you died. Because many of the parents of these children uh, were already orphaned, uh, lost their parents from that dread disease. There was no cure. There was nothing that would cure it. Nothing but bed rest. And what was a day like? There were days when we got medical procedures like the uh, gastric test. Uh, every other week we would get this hose down our nose, had to swallow it, it was awful, into your stomach to test 
how far uh, if you were still infectious. And I counted them, over 50 of them I had. Torture, total torture. We had a little bit of schooling. The teacher would come at a bedside, but most of our time we were too sick, so there was nothing. And, uh, but I learned English. That was very important to me. My parents got me a radio. And I learned it from that, and children's books. I wanted so much to be a real American and learn that language. And one thing, my constant companion was my doll. She sat right next to uh, me on, on the little uh, cart that was there. And there was also some religious training, a Protestant a preacher came in to have Sunday school, and I remember I never knew anything about Jesus before. I mean, I'm Jewish. And I thought it was so fascinating. I co co uh, collected every little booklet that he gave, but I also uh, became friends with a Catholic priest and doctor who was very involved in that, and she said, I'll buy you a beautiful white dress. Have your communion. Please join us. You look like a bride. But I sort of thought it over. No, I don't think I can do that. I'm not really a Christian. And, but I did attend services in the Catholic chapel. They put a chapel, you know, once it was Protestant, once this. Uh, I was the only Jewish child in that hospital and of course I you know Jews are not allowed to eat pork and some other foods but my mother said eat whatever they give you I want you to get well the sooner the better I remember going me wheeled on the wheelchair to go to the Catholic service and I said my prayers in Hebrew and I said you know God hears everywhere it doesn't matter where you pray. He is everywhere. And I felt I, was, I needed to have some religion. I needed to be in a holy place somehow. And that lasted for two years. And I didn't get much better. And my parents had enough. By that time, they had an apartment in Brooklyn, third floor walk up, cold water flat. We had to heat up with kerosene stove. And they took me home. They permitted me to go home. But I still was not in good shape. Couldn't go to school. The Board of uh, Health told me that I'm not healthy enough. I'll be, I'm still contagious. And I cannot go to school. So they uh, support, uh, supplied a homeschool teacher. And she was an elderly lady. She couldn't walk the three flights. So I had nothing. But I had the books. Uh, they gave me the books to read, and I didn't have any friends. And that was the worst for me in the hospital. I had friends. All of a sudden, I have nobody. And I was quite upset about that. And at that time already, I started to write. Little poems, little uh, things. Um, Just gotta get the mic away from Okay. Uh, you know, just to keep myself busy. And um, so finally, I got even worse. And at that time, there was a new drug that was discovered. I was getting worse and worse. I was hemorrhaging. I had absolutely no energy left. They call TB consumption. That is one of the uh, names they give it, the white plague consumption. And I had absolutely no more energy even to sit up in bed and, and uh, you know, bringing up blood, et cetera. I was in very bad shape. The doctor I had in the hospital didn't want to see me anymore. He said, you have to go closer to another doctor. And who actually was my miracle worker, he said, just now a new drug was discovered. The first one ever against tuberculosis, and that was streptomycin. And that was my second miracle. And they, they were two very pain, uh, painful shots twice a day, intramuscularly, for a whole year. But after that, I felt better. By that time, I was 15 years old. 
I needed to go to a real school. And I went, started high school, and I was so happy to have friends again, not to be alone. And I joined every single club there was, the dance club, the German club, the whatever there was, science club. I had a wonderful science teacher, and I never had any science before. I knew in the hospital they showed us, they put a flower in the dark, that flower died, and the one in the light lived. That was my experience with science. But this teacher made it so interesting. And I said, you know, I like this. And he liked me too. And he said, you know, maybe you'd like to study this someday. And I did. And that's how I got involved in science. And I went to a summer school every year because our high school is four years. I didn't want to be 19 years old to graduate while everybody else is 18 or 17. So I went to summer school every year to pick up these extra credits and I finished high school after three instead of four years. And I caught up. Thank you. And I uh, graduated with honors and I knew I wanted my chosen field. I want to be a doctor. And the man in white was so, so much my savior. You know, all I had been around were doctors, hospitals, etc. Then, um, you know, when I finished high school, I chose college. I was accepted. And of course, you have to have your x-rays taken and all that. I didn't want them to know. I had this history. I thought they'll throw me right out. And I kind of scribbled on the paper, did you have this disease, that, and, you know, I pretend that I don't know what they're doing. And, but they took an x-ray and they said, we need more, uh, more tests on you. So they did the test, um, and unfortunately it was positive. So after about six weeks in college, I had to be in bed again. Another year in bed, total bed rest. And this time, they made a cocktail of pills. More things had been discovered. There was a drug called PAS and INH, and again, two shots of streptomycin. The pills made me very sick. There were 26 pills a day, every day, every day, and two shots. I took them in my arm, I took them in my legs. There was no more place to put the shots. In the beginning, my mother, I was told, you can give it to her, and she, I would tell her, uh, she was not a nurse, uh, you know, stick it in already. And she said, I can't, I can't, I don't want to hurt you. I said, do it, you need to do it. Then we had to take somebody to help us. So finally, I started uh, college, and that summer before college, uh, I just had a wonderful time. I was going out with boys. It was, the, I had the time of my life. And um, that's when I got sick again, lost weight. And then finally I started college. And as a pre-med. And um, I, it, I felt quite good, but they told me I cannot walk the stairs. I must take the elevator, and I was hiding. I didn't want anybody to think I am different. And I would hide uh, when, you know, when we had to change classes. And I, um, you know, I became a regular teenager at that time. And um, of course you start dating, went to dances, and by that time I'm about 19, 20 years old, almost 20 because uh, you gradu I graduated high school then at age 19, because I lost uh, a year, and I was in college. And I remember I met this guy, he was a veterinarian, and he wanted to marry me. It was my 21st birthday, and I knew he was going to propose to me. He had been during the war in uh, Siberia, so he was actually saved. And I thought to myself, how am I going to handle this? When you get married, you should be honest with your spouse. Now my father told my mother 
that he was wounded in World War I, he has a, you know, a bad shoulder. So she said, so what? So I figured, okay, I'm going to tell this guy my life story. I need to do this. It was my birthday, December 31st, uh, New Year's Eve, and we went to a nice Russian like, uh, nightclub to dance, and, I, and he started talking about, I want you to meet my parents and all that. I said, you know, I want to tell you something. I know what's coming now. You probably want to marry. And I said, look, I have the story to tell you. And it upset him a lot. Although he was a veterinarian, I wrote a chapter in my second book, They Shoot Horses. You know, a horse will be shot. If they get very sick, they can't walk anymore. And I guess that was his mentality too. And we were supposed to go ice skating next day, and he broke the date. He said, I don't think I can continue with this. It was my first um, rejection, and I took it very badly. I said, look, you can talk to my doctor. He will tell you about me and so forth. I'm fine. I can have children. Everything is fine. I took him to the doctor. It didn't help. And I was so upset, it hurt, again, to be rejected. I had enough rejections in my life. And I changed schools to NYU, and what do I have? An, a lab partner whose name is, starts with an A, Abderazik. And he was an Arab from Jordan. So need I tell you, I fell in love with the Arab. <laughs> what else? So he said, well, you know, we're cousins, you know, I'm Muslim, you're Jewish. We come from Abraham and so forth. I said, okay. So, I mean, we didn't get married, but you know, you could see that you can fall in love with somebody who's totally different and so forth. That didn't work out, but my father would have killed me anyway not to marry somebody in my own religion. And that happened another time like that, uh, even with a medical doctor, and, uh, and then I got fed up with the whole thing. I said, look, I'm not gonna get any more rejections. It's okay, so I don't get married. It's fine. I can live too. And uh, I finished college and uh, became a chemist. Worked for many years as a chemist. And um, some years ago, there was a newspaper I read uh, in a Jewish paper called A Dose of God. Now, usually I would say, oh, that's hocus pocus. You know, um, it is, um, you know, it, you know, it's good to have faith in God and I, I needed God all the time, but, you know, people who don't, you know, it, it was like, the, just praying to God is not going to make you better. Uh, it's God's will too. I mean, it happens and it doesn't. And there were two pages in that uh, article. And on the second page, it said a uh, little paragraph. Um, Albert Schatz, co-discoverer of streptomycin, professor emeritus. I said, oh my God, this man saved my life. Now I knew Dr. Waxman from Rutgers University received the Nobel Prize. We're not talking about the Booby Prize, not the Nobel Prize. And I always wanted to write to him to thank him for giving me my life. And um, this was, a, but he had died in the meantime. And I wrote, uh, called up the newspaper immediately, I need to meet this man, he's probably not young anymore. I need to thank him for giving me the gift of life. And I wrote a letter and he called me up, he lived in Philadelphia, and he told me this incredible story, how he signed the patent with him a poor, uh, he was a poor farm boy who wanted to become a better farmer and went to study at Rutgers University. 
uh, he was the first one to graduate from a university and he um, came under in graduate number one. So Waxman gave him a job. Uh, he got the less, least money any of his students got. And he made the discovery at the age 23. He slept in the basement many times. Later on, he got married. He even took his test tubes with him on his honeymoon. And, um, and then he told me that uh, it was an amazing, amazing story. Uh, of, uh, he sued Waxman, was in the New York Times, that he was the co-discoverer of this amazing drug. Amazing. Even it would be used today for other diseases, for the plague, if, if there's an anthrax, uh, uh, you know, attack. Um, and we wrote a book together, Finding Dr. Schatz. We made a documentary film. And now, when I come back, uh, Merck was the company that produced it. And uh, they invited me to make a broadcast to 70,000 people, all the employees they have around the world, telling my story. I mean, this was just plain amazing. Now, I know I have about 10 minutes left. I worked for uh, 38 years for medical research and clinical work, and my dream to become a doctor did come true up to a point. I got my, ex um, my acceptance in Heidelberg Medical School, which was at one time the best medical school in the world, actually. I didn't try in America. I was a little older. I was over 30. And I didn't feel I was, my health was good enough. And by that time, it was. I had worked already about 10 years. And I got accepted. And I went to Europe, quit my job where I worked. And um, they were singing Nazi songs at night. I had to go first to have my credits evaluated. And, um, and I opened my windows in this little uh, village where I stayed, ready to start school. And I couldn't believe it. They were saying, Kameraden und Genossen marschieren auch in unseren Reihen mit ost wessel song. I couldn't believe it. This is 1968. How could it happen? I called up my mother. I said, they're singing Nazi songs. So she said, I told you not to go. You don't listen to your mother. Mother knows best. And I went back and went back to work for some quite famous people. But I would like, before I end, so this was my second miracle. And it came out at the time when I was absolutely at death's door. I even wrote a poem about when will death come to me. I mean, I, I was finished, done. But I always had hopes, um, I'm going to fight this no matter what. I want to be a normal person again. I don't have to be a genius, and that's what it went also when I got out of the hospital. I just want to be what teenagers do, just to be a, a normal person. Now, I am here today. I mean, I speak all over, and I would like to take about five minutes to let you ask me some questions. Very important. Don't waste the time. Ask me, because the opportunity uh, to uh, Speak to a survivor is becoming almost nil. We're getting older, and you're at the far end of the world. That's even more difficult. So please ask me. No question is uh, stupid. It's stupid not to ask. And because later on, you have to read all of this in books. And, you know, books are books. They're fine. Or in films, Hollywood, you know, people can tweak things. Does any, I can take two, three questions, and then I want to finish the program. Please, anybody have a question? Nobody? Come on, question. Yes, please. Loud, maybe. When, in America? Yes, in America. Uh, not necessarily Jewish, no. I have friends today, for instance, every color of the rainbow. I live in New York City, in the borough of Queens, which is the most diverse place in the whole country. 
I live in a row house between a Muslim, very devout Muslim family from Bangladesh and one Hindu family uh, from British Guyana, now it's called Guyana. The walls are the same, then there's a Christian house. And you know the Muslims don't like the Hindus, the Hindus don't like the Muslims, I'm the buffer, I'm the Jew in the middle, but that's not how it is in my neighborhood. We all are friends with each other. And I wish the world would be like that. Anybody else have a question? Yes. How many times do... A few times. Oh, I have breakdowns in between. But now I'm already negative since 1950, when is it now? The last time was, uh, 58 was the last time I had anything. I'm totally fine. I mean, I was accepted to medical school knowing my history. You had to give a medical history. Now, if you don't have questions, I will add one thing. I'm always asked, do you forgive the Germans? for what they did to you. And I, my answer is, I do not forgive the actual killers who killed my family. For me, such things can only be forgiven by God. It is too terrible. I mean, the ones who have seen Auschwitz, you'll see what it was like. A million people in one place alone. But, I believe in reconciliation. Last year, I was in Auschwitz. I take tours there, you know, with groups. And we're walking, it's a huge place. We're walking into, from Auschwitz proper to Birkenau. And I hear German spoken. I said, what, German? Here in this hellhole? And I went over to them and spoke German with them. And they had a guide there. And they were younger people, a whole family from Frankfurt, and you know what we did? We embraced in that hellhole. I, yes, we did, we did. And I um, have many friends in Germany, many who were born after the war, even my best, I have some friends yet from my childhood, my best friend unfortunately died a few weeks ago. Um, but to uh, forgive somebody like Dr. Mengele or some of these killers, uh, to me, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't make me a bad person, but uh, you know, things, uh, terror like that and killings can only be forgiven by a higher power and that is God. But I can become friends again with them. Now, my hope, my wish, and prayer is for every child to grow up in peace without hunger and prejudice. I'm the only child from, the, from Württemberg, the state of Württemberg, who was transported from Stuttgart. I'm the only child who returned. And I want to read you just a short poem about peace. War is hell. I wish there would never be another war, another holocaust, another terror for any, especially the children, because children are innocent. Every child grows up innocent. And I have a poem, short poem I want to read you. Peace. An acorn gives life to a thousand trees. Many tiny raindrops form the greatest seas. Nothing is impossible if only we try. The smallest tree can reach the sky. We may differ in thought and ideas. Every mother cries some salty tears. If flowers can grow in desert sand, hate can turn to love in any land. All wars must cease. There will be peace. Pick a rose with its thorn. A world of peace for each newborn. Let's share the milk and honey today. Where there is will, there is a way. Beat each sword into a plowshare. We must search our hearts and care. Together, we can survive and win. The time is now. Let us begin. All wars must cease. There will be peace. I have one favor to ask of you. 
Could you all, the ones who can, stand up, every single one of you, and hold hands in your row? Can you do that for me, please? The ones who can stand, the other ones can hold hands. And if you can't, you just hold hands with the next. Everybody make a chain, hold hands. And in unison, we will say, Shalom, which means peace. May peace, yes, you can do that too. You can go across the aisle if you can do it. We are all one humanity, where no matter where we come from, it's we're all God's children. And let us all say Shalom, loud, one, two, three, Shalom. Peace be with you and love uh, be with you. It is a greater thing than hate. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Now you can eat, I suppose. The first one, and we were at one time about 1,200 people close to it. At the end of the three years, there were 13 survivors, 13, and a whole family intact, mother, father, and child. That alone was a miracle, because that hardly ever happened. And they picked us up with a bus. Uh, all the people from the different transports, uh, there were a few of them, so maybe about 50 people or so. And we went through war-torn Europe, especially Germany. I saw Leipzig uh, right after the war, and Dresden, which was firebombed tremendously. Uh, there were no houses standing. We arrived in Stuttgart, and they put us into what was called a displaced persons camp, because we didn't know where to go. I remember my first meal there. They had beautiful white tablecloths on the table, and they gave us a chicken noodle soup. This was the first good meal I had in three years, because it got so bad in Terrazin that we would even eat dandelion leaves. You had no vegetables, so to have a real, bowl of soup. It was, I ate it so slow. Other camps who were not liberated yet because Eichmann still wanted to kill every single Jew in Europe. Auschwitz was liberated in January, but the war was still going on and the Holocaust was still going on. That's why even gas chambers were being prepared in Terrazin, where I was, they were not complete yet, and they were bringing in these horribly, horribly sick people from Buchenwald, from other places where they were not uh, liberated yet. And they kept all that from us about gas chambers. In fact, there was a family camp in Auschwitz. They called it the Terrazin family camp. And they had to write back to us Oh, it is so nice here. Come and join us. That family camp was completely liquidated uh, and soon afterwards. Now, we were on quarantine right after the war. Even it was written up in the New York Times, and we could not go home. Finally, a bus came from Stuttgart, from where we were transported from, to pick up the few survivors. There were a few transports that landed in Terrazin. Ours was celebrated almost every year, wherever I am. The experience, the joy of being alive. My talk yesterday was about my first miracle, staying alive, giving the gift of life. While in my camp we were 15,000 children only 1% made it, and I'm standing in front of you. That is a miracle. 
But I have, thank you. I have a second miracle, which will become apparent, what I'm going to talk to you about. Now, we had no clue where our families were taken to, aunts, uncles, more distant relatives. But the end of the war, we lost at least 13 immediate members, including my beloved grandmother. We didn't want to believe that she was gone, still hope in our heart, and 20 altogether, more distant relatives, 20 people in my family were slaughtered. That's, there's no better word that I said yesterday. Now we had a tremendous typhus epidemic at the end of the war. They brought in people from only just to taste every little, uh, every little drop. And we stayed there a very short time and made our way back to my grandmother's little village, hoping maybe she did survive, maybe. We went back and that house was taken away when we were deported. And there were people living there. And they prepared one room for us in our own house. That house belonged to us. There were people there, living there. A short, of course, my grandmother wasn't standing at the door. It became really apparent to us she will never come back. And we moved then to a neighboring town, got an apartment, and life was good. I went back to school. I didn't know what grade I belonged to. Fourth grade, fifth grade. I never even finished my first grade. And I will say, the children and the people at that time were quite nice to us. Of course, everybody said, well, we didn't know about that, we feel bad, and all that. Uh, and we were asked, can you point out some of the people who did harm you at that time, who were bad to you? And we did not point to anybody. We stayed in Germany. Good morning, everybody. It is such a gift for me and an honor to be here with you today. And I'm immensely grateful that I made this journey and that you chose me to be part of this amazing, amazing meeting. I sent an email this morning to some of my friends and I said, I'm in paradise. It doesn't have to look any better. Now, war was over on May 8th, 1945, in Europe. Not in Asia yet. But it was not over as far as, yes, we are liberated on May 8th, 1945 maybe the last camp that was liberated by the Russians. Other people were liberated by Americans. We didn't care who came, just somebody who should come and, and bring us to life again. So May 8th became my second birthday. And I 